Praise God, church. Our reading today comes from the book of First John, chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. On our church Bibles, it's on page 959. My name is John, and I uh, hope you're there. So after being challenged by my growth group members, I will read from the tablet of my heart. First John, uh, chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. Now we'll read. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. We share. Thank you. John and I are from the same uh, GG group. Some of you did not get what I was saying. <laughs> I pray that the Lord helps you to understand these things. Sisi ni watu tuko deep. This is what we do every Thursday when we meet. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, Father, the world, sin, and the devil reminds us time and again that we need to love this world, the things of this world, and put Jesus at the periphery. Please help us this morning as we consider the truth in your word that we will understand what we need to do how we need to do it to love you and to love your people as we live in this world and having a kingdom perspective as we wait for your coming. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My name is John Swekenyi, married to Paris, uh, and uh, the Lord has uh, blessed us with three daughters, Olive, Daisy, and Hazel. And uh, I serve in this church as one of the elders, a lay elder, and I'm glad to be sharing with you God's word this morning. Twice or thrice in this service, I am going to call you to a time of participation. And so uh, I hope that uh, we are all going to participate in this uh, service this morning. So here comes our first moment of participation in the sermon. For the preteens and parents and all of us, here's a question for us. For the, so for the preteens, anyone willing to give an answer to this, what are some of the things or what are some of the rules your parents have put for you at home? Anyone? Okay, for fear of your parents, let's say at school. <laughs> your teachers are not here. At school, what are some of the, some of the rules that uh, your teachers have put? These guys have no rules. Okay, parents, what are some of the rules you put for your children at home? Brush your teeth before bed. Yes, Rhoda. Be on the table when it's dinner time or miss eating. Okay. <laughs> no, the last one I added, she did not say miss eating. 
but that by implication it means if you are not on the table, you won't eat. Food is only served at the table. Anyone else? Learn to share your toys with joy. Even when you are crying, ensure that you are crying in joy as you share your toys. So then you realize the question would be, why have you set those boundaries or rules? Let's find out before you answer that question, why do we have those boundaries or rules? So, well, why I ask that question, we have all, or perhaps most of us have grown up in families where we are, uh, or we have clear boundaries on what the expectations are, or are like for good family cohesion. Maybe for some of us, we were just left like uh, wild grass, in our mother tongue we say sangara, to just grow and become what you will become, and there are no rules, no boundaries that have been set for proper family cohesion. For those who are working, or even for employers among us this morning, there are rules that you put in the organization that ensure that everyone is working towards a common goal of the organization. Last week, it was wonderful to hear that uh, great reminder by Reverend Harrison in the Swahili service about the people who are building our roads and they put barricades all over. You wake up one morning and you discover there is a barricade. And the reason why they are doing this is because they want to tame some of us when we are driving along these roads to put us on the check. But the main reason for doing this, for you setting up those rules at home, or even at work, in school, is out of great love. The people who are doing this, who are setting these rules, are doing this because of love. Well, it's possible for you to think, my parents are just being stingy. Or perhaps my boss is just being nagging and setting up all these kinds of uh, rules for me to follow. The bottom line is, perhaps even your boss or your parent may not know for some of those rules that they put across, but the reason behind this is out of great love for you. In other, way, in other words, they are putting a lot of warning signs on the way of this life for you to be able to navigate life in a manner and in a way that will not hurt you and will not hurt other people or even put them in danger. So the question is whether we obey or follow all these rules and warning signs and the do nots. I am sure parents here will have those many do nots uh, in their hearts, okay? And uh, when something is done at home, that's the time to pull the do not, maybe that was not mentioned to the children. But the question is, do we all follow these warning signs? In our passage this morning, as it has been uh, read to us by John, we see a number of warning signs that have been put for us to see and follow. And we shall be considering those in a moment. But just a quick flashback. Two weeks ago, Ken reminded us in this same chapter, chapter 2, from verse 1 to 14, how God's people or how believers ought to love the Lord, how believers ought to love one another, or are to love God's people. And today we are going to see what you can loosely call 
forbidden love or hatred for this world. Sounds uh, like a complicated thing. Love cannot be forbidden, some, someone might say. But here, John recalls to us one of those things that I can easily say, this is forbidden love. In other words, the things that believers are not supposed to do. We read again in this chapter, chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. This is what the Bible says. Do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. What does John mean by the world? What does he mean when he says the world? Does John mean that we need to hate this physical world that we are living in? Does he mean that uh, you and I need to hate all that is existing in this world, fellow human beings, animals, vegetation, and the likes that are in this world, by no means is John saying that. In fact, we read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, and the Bible says that all that God created was good. And John does not mean for us to hate this physical world in the literal sense, because all that God created was good. All that John means to tell us when he says, do not love the world, he means to tell us to steer away from a system of this world. So that word, world, as we can read from the three verses, simply means the system of this world. He tells us to steer away from the system of this world that is in enmity with the Lord Jesus Christ, that contradicts the gospel, that does not honor the Lord Jesus Christ, and pushes him to the periphery. In other words, what John is saying that John is talking about hating the world and uh, comparing it to a place where the gospel is not welcome. This is the world that John is talking about in part, a place where the, the gospel is not welcome. For some of us, could that be at our workplace? Perhaps for others, could that be in our church this morning? Yet, for most of us, if not all of us, could that be in our very own hearts? Is this where the gospel is not welcome? Is this what forms part of the system of your world? As he recalls when he starts this chapter, he says, little children, I write to you, and he says, do not love this world. I hope when we were reading uh, those three uh, verses in chapter 2, 15 to 17, you saw how the word, the world has been repeated. In fact, in those three, chap in, in, in those three verses, the word, the world has re been repeated six times. For those keen in doing Bible interpretation, why there is repetition is because the author seeks to place emphasis on what he's saying. And this is exactly what John is doing by repeating the word, 
the world to his recipients and to us this morning. You notice then that with this emphasis that this is a big thing that John wants us to get. John wants us to understand why this is important and why he is writing this. And John is reminding us that loving God and loving one another is shown in refraining from loving In verse 1 to verse 14, we saw that uh, believers love the Lord, believers love one another, or believers love God's people. And our love for God will only be shown when we are not putting too much or not at all loving this world. And loving this world means the systems of this world. It is easy for you and me to think about the world system as things that you are doing or others are doing, but rather we should be thinking about a world system as things that we are, that rather the world system is simply the things we are and not the things that we are doing. Friends, I hope you notice that worldliness is invisible, as we shall be seeing shortly uh, in some three illustrations as given to us by John, that worldliness is invisible. We cannot easily see it. Others can't see it and won't see it up front. There could be manifestations of the same, but in most cases, worldliness is invisible. So then as Christians, we are caught in a catch-22. How do we live in this world and not be of this world? A good reminder for us there that true Christians are marked by their genuine love for God, while non-Christians are marked by their love for this world. True Christians are marked by their genuine love for the Lord Jesus Christ, while non-Christians are marked by their love for this world. In other words, their love for the systems of this world. Brothers and sisters, human desires are part of God's creation. And that's why we read in Genesis 1, that, 1, that all that God created was good. These desires are only evil when expressed in ways for which God did not create them. So then as we read through the passage, what are some of these things or what are these things that John is warning, is putting the warning signs for us, hazards on that we should not love while living in this world as believers. We read again, in chapter 2, verse 16. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Three things that you note from uh, that verse, verse 16, which will form a basis of our discussion again this morning. The first thing is the desires of the flesh. In other translations, they say the last of the flesh. The desires of the flesh or the last of the flesh. The second thing, the desires of the eyes or the last of the eyes. And the last thing, the pride of life. The last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the pride of life. Some quick definition for our preteens. The word lust, as I will refer to it uh, interchangeably with uh, desires, the word lust simply means a strong desire for something.
a strong desire for something that is lust or the desire, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life. So lust simply means a strong desire for something. So let's take some time and look at these three things together this morning. The lust of the flesh. Here is the second moment for you to participate in this sermon. I'm going to ask you to do something that might be painful for some of you. Could you please pinch yourself? Yes, I said pinch yourself. What did you feel? Pain on your flesh. Do you think John is talking about that flesh that you pinched in this in this verse? Do you think that is what John is referring to? The desires of the flesh or the lust of the flesh? Do you think that is what John is referring to? No, not by all means. What John is saying about the desires of the flesh or the lust of the flesh, the flesh in this context is simply everything that you are apart from Christ. Everything that you are apart from Christ. So then you may ask, does this mean even all the good things that I have, my abilities, my gifts, yes, it means all that. That is the flesh. So when John talks about the last of the flesh, he refers to human strong desires, to satisfy ourselves at Christ's expense. We want to do this, we want to do that at the expense of Christ, at the expense of the gospel. So then you ask, with all this, how would the last of the flesh look like, brothers and sisters? Like I said before, it, it will simply look like uh, satisfying your normal human desires in a way that dishonors God. And remember we said that these are desires, okay? Even the good things that you might be thinking about, that you might be having, the last of the flesh simply would look like satisfying your normal human desires in a way that dishonors the Lord. Let me give you an example. Is being thirsty wrong? Is it wrong to be thirsty? By all means, it's not. It's not wrong to be thirsty. But is it possible to be thirsty in a way that dishonors the Lord? Yes. For some people, it might mean one for the Lord. It turns out to be many for the road, then many takes you to the ditch or the mutaro, okay? It is possible to be thirsty and dishonor the Lord by becoming a drunkard, and in no way am I advocating that you need to be doing that, okay? But a good human desire of being thirsty, you could take water, you could do something that could elevate the thirst, but then turns out that you want to satisfy your human desire by dishonoring the Lord in a way, perhaps becoming a drunkard. Another example, is it wrong to be lonely? Is it wrong to be lonely? So then is it possible to be lonely in a way that dishonors the Lord? Certainly yes. For some people, 
it might be through some unnatural uh, tendencies like masturbation, pornography, a desire to be wanted, a desire to be loved, expressed in a way that dishonors the Lord. And the one that is hot on the heels is the whole issue of I want to choose who I am, what gender I am. It's no longer male or female. I want to choose who I marry. Man, marrying man, and women, marrying women. Because it's a choice that we want to make. This is a world system that the Lord is reminding us, do not love this world system. So just see that a good human desire to be loved turned into a thing that dishonors the Lord Jesus Christ. This John reminds us that we should steer away from. Brothers and sisters, we shouldn't love this, this world and satisfy our desires in a way that dishonors the Lord or puts him on the periphery. Second up is the last of the eyes. Forgive me, that is not supposed to be what you are seeing on the screen. It should be something else. I forgot to edit that. But I will let you know what this is all about, the last of the eyes. So think about this as a coveting. It's a big word, coveting. We meet it several times in the Bible. Think about it as coveting or covetousness. And for our preteens, covetousness, is simply a desire for something or things you already have enough of. A desire for things or something you already have enough of. How would this look like? In this normal life, it is presented to us in many shades, in many, in many forms, in many ways, but maybe a few things that you and I can relate to right here. It could be things like, oh, I saw a good new car, so I want one like that, the last of the eye. I saw a good house in the neighborhood. I could do with one like that. For our preteens in school, I saw someone with a nice pen. My parents should buy for me one like that. Or I will do all that it will take for me to get one like that. Maybe for some of us, this could be a struggle. I've seen a nice man, a nice woman, and I simply think that I need to add this one to my list. And I say this last one with a lot of caution, that the mapping should be one is to one, and only when the time is right. So for my preteens, please don't get, it, get this wrong, don't get this twisted that you only get into that relationship when the time is right. For those who are considering marriage or just relationships, those who are married, brothers and sisters, the mapping is one is to one. It is not more than that. The last of the eye will tell you that man, that woman, really looks good. I want that one. But no. 
this is not what the Bible is telling us. This is what the world is pushing to us. For those who live along Thika Road, there could be a few here. You, you will notice that uh, our beer companies will always put billboards that are encouraging people to take alcohol on your way home. They face on your way home, not on your way to work. An assignment for you, go check it out. So that you see and you're like, I'm thirsty. Need one. Okay? So those billboards will always be on your way home and not on your way to, to work. The last of the eye will always tell you just one. One more. Brothers and sisters, your eyes are the gateway to your heart. It may sound like a motivational speak, but in its literal sense that your eyes are the gateway to your heart. What gets through your eyes gets into your heart, and that ultimately affects your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So you need to guard how your eyes are consuming what this world is offering. I like what, what, what one presidential candidate recently said in one of our TV stations during uh, an interview. He was asked a question and he asked back. So this interviewer asked him, what do you own? And he, he asked the interviewer, how much is too much for one person. How much is too much for one person? The tendency of this world could easily tell you just one more. Whatever you've seen, just one more will make you satisfied. Just one more. Go for it. And this candidate goes ahead to say, does owning five houses mean I have enough? Does it? Just one more. And the sixth one will come. As a matter of fact, how many beds can you sleep on in one night? Just one. Just one. So then, brothers and sisters, why do our eyes help us to put all these things, the world system, into perspective, feed, feed into our hearts, and keep on amassing more and more and more to ourselves? By the way, unlike the last of the flesh, did you notice that the last of the eyes cannot be seen? Did you notice that? That we cannot quantify, we cannot see what you are seeing. Unlike the, la the last of the flesh, which can be manifested in things like drunkenness, in things like adultery if you are caught, the last of the eyes, we can only be saying so and so is flourishing. But we cannot say for sure what these eyes are fed into your heart. The pride of life. Pride of life, the third one. Loosely think about this as everything is all about me. Everything centers around me. It is me 
myself, and I. You cannot do anything apart from me. Only one person can say that. That's Jesus Christ. The rest of us, this is what we call the pride of, the pride of life. You would say that this is anything that, that exhausts us or our situation, our situation and offers an illusion of us being godlike or having godlike qualities and boast in loss of arrogance or in the worldly wisdom. Friends, how would this look like in our everyday life? Maybe the famous question pops in. Do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? In most cases, when people are asking that question, where do you think the conversation is headed to? They are simply telling you, you are the most inferior person that I've ever met. The one before you is a superior. As a matter of fact, you should have known who I am before talking to me. The pride of life. Do you know who I am? How would that look again in our everyday life? The pride of life is boasting about what one does for a living. It's easy for me to say if someone asks you, who are you? And I quickly say, I am a software engineer. What that quickly tells the other person is, Forget about the bit of software. This guy is an engineer. Okay? So start treating that person with loss of respect. But if I told you, I am a tout, where do you place me? Yes. Boasting about what people do in this livelihood and the abundance of things that we have because of what we do. And you see, friends, the world puts a lot of emphasis on this, what we do for a living. The world judges those who are poor in the now and exhausts those who are rich. Is it a wonder then that in the run-up from now until August next year, we will see a lot of those people coming around to us. And our human system, the world system, has created in us that illusion that the person with lots of money to give out is the leader that we want. And so, we will not care about that poor person who has lots of wisdom for leadership, but we will go for that arrogant, wealthy, where we do not know where the wealth came from person to become our leader. In fact, we like to say, kama ye ni mwizi, ni mwizi wetu. At least atakula na, atakula na sisi. Just this week, I could not help but mourn for our country when I was hearing politicians from a certain region saying that we cannot miss being on the negotiating table. That if our person is there, our interests are well served. The pride of life. The system of this world will push us to believe this kind of narrative.
how would that again look for some of us, perhaps in our workplaces? It could look like trying to get credit for things that you have not done, while clearly it is others who did the work. If you did not do it, don't get the credit. Point the credit to the right people. The pride of life will not allow you. Our young men like to say, Kiburi hainikubalishi. Huh? The pride of life will not allow you to give credit where it is due. But this is not what the Bible tells us, that we shouldn't love the system of this world. Pride of life being one of them. So then, friends, these three things that John warns us about, did you notice that they are the same old tricks that the devil has used from the beginning? Do you notice that? Let me show you just right now. I'll read for you. Don't have to flip over. Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. This is what the Bible says. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate it and she gave some to her husband who was there with her. Just in case you did not see or notice those three things, let me point them out for you. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, last of the flesh, or the desires of the flesh, and that it was a delight to the eyes, last of the eyes, and the, that the tree was good to make, and the, that the tree was desired to make one wise, pride of life. Maybe you, you might say that that's an isolated case. Let me take you to another one. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3 to 10. We meet Jesus in the desert after he has prayed and fasted. This is what the devil tells him. Verse 3. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. What is that? Last of? We go down to verse 5, verse 6 rather. And he said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels con concerning you. What is that? What is that? The pride of life. And David helped us to see that. Perhaps you did not see, but now you can see when he read the opening psalm in Psalm 91. Verse 8. This is what the devil uh, does again to Jesus. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to, to him, All these I'll give to you if you fall down and worship me. What is that? The last of the eyes. See, friends, the devil has used the same old tricks over and over. He doesn't have any new things left for him to use. It is the same three. They may not come as all of them to you at once, but this is the pattern we see, that the devil will use these three things as what is in his armory to present the world system to you. The last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the pride of life. So that over and over, the devil wants to help you help you in quotes, push the word of God, the gospel, and Jesus to the periphery and the world system taking over. And John wants us, tells us, do not love 
this world. As, as I've said, friends, these have been and will continue to be the things that the devil will use to draw us away from the love of the Father. Woe to us if Woe to us if we, if we fall into this trap and love the world more than loving the Father. For we are told, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. But do you notice what John says in verse 17 of chapter 2? The world is passing away with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Yes, friends, all these three things, all these three things will pass away. They will diminish the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Remember the reason why John puts all these warning signs about us not loving the world is because he knows that is our predisposition that we, by default, will want to love the world. And this is what the world system wants us to do. But these great warnings are there for you and I to heed to so that we do not fall into this trap of, wa of wanting to love the world and then being stripped off of the love of God. For God wants us to love him, to love his people, and to continually be in a fellowship or communion with him. So then, brothers and sisters, here are two things that uh, we can take home as way of way of application in this sermon. The reasons John wants to pay us to pay the more attention or keen interest to the warnings that he has given us concerning the love of this world or the love of the systems of this world. So the first thing is that the world and its desires are passing away. We read in verse 17. This is what the Bible says. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. It's a great reminder for you and I to know that the things we cherish, we hold so dearly in this world, be it what satisfies our flesh, be it what goes through our eyes, or what we are boasting about in this life, about who we are, what we are doing, brothers and sisters, these things will pass away. The second thing, John wants us to know that there is eternal life for those who do God's will in this present life. There is eternal life for those who do God's will in this present life. Brothers and sisters, God calls us to a life of loving him, loving his people, loving one another, and hating anything that draws us away from him. That is anything that pushes him outside, anything that pushes the gospel away. You and I are called to love the Lord, to love one another, and to live in this world, but not be of this world. 